Back in the 1980s, a logo appeared in Thailand, Ya Hin Katua, which can be translated as, don't be self-centered. It was in the shape of a Buddha. Don't was the head, be was the neck, self was the torso and arms, and centered was the legs. And John Sweat took exception to this. He said, this is not a Buddhist message. The Buddha wants us to be self-centered. Of course, what he meant by that was not self-centered in a selfish, unfeeling way. It was more centered on the fact that the problem lies within us, and we're the ones who have to solve it. After all, that's the Buddha's analysis and the Four Noble Truths. We suffer not because of what other people do, and the path to the end of suffering is not straightening other people out. We suffer from what we're doing, and the path lies in straightening ourselves out. So that's where our focus has to be. That's where we have to be centered. What this means is not that we have to forget about being self-centered. We have to be self-centered in a wise way. We have to learn how to do it in a skillful way. And that deals with two big problems. One is when you're irritated by other people's behavior. You should center your attention not so much on their behavior, what's irritating about it. Center on your own irritation. Why do you let yourself get worked up about it? What's the problem? Where are you feeling offended by that other person? That's what you've got to look into. Now, this doesn't mean you don't care about other people. It's simply that you've got to develop the Brahma Viharas, all for them, both toward them and toward yourself. You have goodwill for them, you have compassion, empathetic joy, but you realize there are times when their behavior is their behavior and you can't do much about it, or even if you could do something about it, you would lose your focus. It might be misdirected, especially if you have that problem within yourself. Remember the Buddha's instructions to monks who are going to make an accusation to another monk. First off, you have to make sure that you don't have the same problem in your own behavior. You have to make sure that you're doing it not to inflict an offense on the other monk, but actually to get the monk out of the offense. And you have to do it with an attitude of goodwill. I've known some cases where it's taken years for an accuser to get around to actually developing the right attitude before making an accusation. But it was worth it. The accuser learned a lot of lessons about himself, and when the issue came up, it was a lot easier to resolve. So your focus has to be not on what other people are doing wrong, but what are you doing wrong? If you're going to look at their behavior, look at it as a mirror. What does it tell you about you? in your behavior. That's bringing everything back inside. And it's being self-centered in a wise way. That relates to the second problem, is that voice of your inner critic focuses on looking at your behavior. This has to be trained. For all too many of us, our inner critic is not very helpful. We've been criticized in harsh, unfeeling, dismissive ways in the past, and we've tended to pick up those voices and internalize them. As we said before, the Buddha said that our practice is one of looking for the Dharma through committing ourselves to the practice and reflecting on what we're doing. And the voice of that reflection has to be trained, just as the committed side has to be trained. And one of the first lessons you've got to learn, 
learn is that approach this as an experiment. Approach this as you would approach playing a sport. There has to be a certain light-hearted attitude to what you're doing. It is serious, but you can't make it grim. Because if the criticism comes and it's too heavy, you're not going to pick it up and carry it with you. You're just going to leave it there or let it oppress you. But if the criticism is light, you can pick it up, carry it around. Use it to remind yourself the next time, okay, the last time I was in this situation I made that mistake. I don't want to make it again. And think of someone mastering a sport, someone trying to make shots in basketball. You stand there and you miss. You try it again. You miss again. Try it again. You keep at it until you finally get it, and then you get it again, and then get it again. What's the attitude that that person has? How does that person talk to him or herself? That's the way you've got to talk to yourself as a meditator, as a practitioner in general. If the critical voice is, is dismissive, that puts an end to the, the practice session. You have to have an encouraging voice as well. Here too you bring in the Brahmaviharas. The critical voice has to have compassion. But you also have to have empathetic joy for the times when you do it right. Because you need encouragement. Remember the Buddha talking about knowing the time to say pleasing things, knowing the time to say displeasing things. Well, that's how your critic has to be trained. And what you may learn is that you've got lots of critics in there. Here too, you can think of the Committee of the Mind. You've got to ferret out which voice is the one that's really worth listening to, just because one voice is loud and repetitive. doesn't mean that you have to take it seriously. Try to listen to the voices that are compassionate, that do want you to do it well, and are happy when you do it well. The equanimity there is for realizing, okay, this is going to take time. And so you're willing to put in time and not get discouraged by the first couple of times when you stumble, or when things are going well, and then all of a sudden there's a dry patch and they're not going well. So as John Fung would say, learn how to play at the meditation, the same way that a sportsman would play at a sport. Have a lighthearted attitude toward it. Not that you don't realize that it is serious. It is. But we're working on something cheerful, the attempt to put an end to suffering. And although it requires determination and persistence and endurance, it should also be done with joy. Here again, Ajahn Sawat, have a sense of how fortunate you are to do this practice. Take joy in the fact that you can. And when you can develop that attitude, then you're self-centered in the right way. As long as you need a self, and you will all the way up through non-returning. Train it to be a friendly self, a self on your side, a self that gets you properly centered, i.e. centered in right concentration, 
where you're coming from a position of strength and well-being. With a happiness that doesn't take anything away from anyone else at all. When the time comes to let go of that self, you're not letting go out of hatred or out of neurotic fear. You let go simply because you realize you don't need it anymore. Think of the image of the raft. The person gets to the other side of the river and has appreciation for the raft. This raft has been very helpful. I'll leave it here for somebody else, and then you can go on your way. So as long as you need that sense of self in the path, learn how to be self-centered wisely. And when the time comes to let go, just as you've held this self lightly, you can let it go with a sense of lightness as well.